I'm the Comic Weekly Man, the jolly Comic Weekly Man, and I'm here to read the funnies to you happy boys and honeys. Yes, boys and girls, it's Comic Weekly time, and here I come right into your house to bring a little fun and happiness, right out of the pages of Puck the Comic Weekly, straight into your living room, your friend, the Comic Weekly Man, the jolly Comic Weekly Man. Hello, hello. Hello, hello, hello. <laughs> Little Miss Honey, how are you today? Oh, I'm just fine, just fine, thank you. It's already February. Well, just think, do you like February? Oh, I like February. Many interesting things happen in February. What things, for instance? Well, there's Valentine's Day and Abraham Lincoln's birthday and George Washington's birthday. That's right. Say, this is a busy month. Which birthday do you like the best? I like them all, but I like Valentine's the best because on that day you can have a party, and I just love to go to parties. Yes, but some days you have a whole holiday from school, on Washington's birthday, for instance. Oh, yes, yes, I like days like that, too. Uh, but one day I like the best of all. What day is that? This day, because this is the day you always read me the funnies. Well, thank you. <laughs> You're welcome. So please read the funnies now. Very well, I'll read them in just a moment. But before I do, let's listen to this nice man. Now, here we go with Puck the Comic Weekly. And on the first page, hop along, Cassidy. Magic words for the music, please. Very well, my lady. Six guns blazing as he thunders along. Give us music for Hop Along. <laughs> Hoppy and his pals, California and Lucky, have come upon a herd of stolen cattle in a canyon. After a brush with the rustlers, the rustlers have ridden off. The leader in a horse and buggy is trying to escape. Hoppy hightails after him. California shouts to Lucky. Hey, we better get this stolen herd to the bar 20 before them rustlers decide to come back. Lucky, seeing Hoppy close in on the man in the buggy, replies, Yeah, maybe we'll learn where they came from if Hoppy catches that one. Last picture top row, Hoppy closes in on the escaping buggy. He leaps to the swaying rig. <clears throat> now, mister. First picture, second row, holding a gun on the man in the buggy, he says, Keep driving. We're a long way from where you're going. The man keeps driving without saying a word. Hoppy, who's facing the man, his back in the direction where they're going, sees three horsemen following them. But what he doesn't see is that the road leads under a low-hanging limb. Suddenly, Hoppy's captive veers the carriage to one side and drives Hoppy into the limb. Oh. Hoppy is knocked unconscious. And as he falls to the floor of the buggy, last picture, second row, the rustler reins in and stops. Quickly, he frisks Hoppy, looking for identification papers. And first picture, bottom row, the other rustlers ride up, and one of them says, Hey, you handle that galoot right smart, boss. Who is he? Boss replies, Well, according to his papers, his name's Cassidy. Works for the bar 20. Suddenly, the boss gives the horse hitch to the buggy a slap. Get up there! As the buggy with Hoppy lying unconscious goes wildly down the trail, one of the rustlers exclaims, Hey, what's the idea? We should have finished him off! The boss replies, yeah, he's finished now. That runaway horse follows the right-hand fork. Cassidy will land in the buckskin jail for stealing the rig. The left fork will drop him off suicide summit. Oh, poor Hoppy. That was a terrible hit he got on the head. You'd think he'd be killed dead. You certainly would have. I hope I hope that horse takes the turn to town and, and not over the cliff. So do I. Maybe Hoppy can explain to the people in town what has happened to him. Yes, maybe they'd believe that he didn't steal the buggy. Well, that's something we'll find out next week. Now... Well, now let's go over the page and see if Prince Valiant is there. Very well, over the page we go to page three. And see, I'm right, I'm right. See, there they are. And you remember last week, King Agua was good to Bolchar because he told Bolchar that he and Tillicum could be married. Yes, so let's read now and see how the newlyweds are making out. Here we go with Prince Valiant in the days of King Arthur. Hecate, Breckett, Grey Malkin, and Quince. Music romantic for a fair, fair prince. <laughs> Last picture top row, Boltar brings his bride home to his high-beamed hall. A raised stone fireplace runs down the center of the room for cooking and heating, the smoke escaping through the open gables overhead. 
Along the wall, curtain stalls provide sleeping quarters. Carved benches and tables make up the simple furnishings. The life of Boltar's household is a simple one. As we see, first picture, next row. At mealtime, the women serve their hearty menfolk, making endless trips to the ale cellar and bakery or the storehouse for salted fish or smoked meats. Then, as we see, last picture, second row, the women sit down for a leisurely meal and gossip. Boltar's mother is the head of the household, according to custom. All this is familiar to Tillicum, for it's also the custom of her faraway tribe. And the older woman, Boltar's mother, looking keenly at Tillicum, the newcomer, nods in approval. Here, indeed, she thinks, is a fitting mate for her warrior son. Finally, the time comes when Boltar's restless spirit drives him to sea again. And then Tillicum returns to the palace of Prince Val and to take care of her young charge, Prince Arn. First picture, bottom row. Prince Valiant, who has also been quiet for a long while, content to play with his children and worship his fair lady, gets restless too. And last picture, he goes to the study and calls his young friend Arf from his work copying papers and says, All right, get ready to travel. We go to overlook our borders and perhaps to do a little hunting. that Boltar and Tillicum are married. Now everyone's happy. Yes, everyone's happy. But my goodness, don't they eat big meals? Oh, yes, they were heavy eaters in those days. You see, when you're out of doors, it's good to eat, and in those days, they were out of doors most of the time. Yes, and isn't it too bad that Boltar has to go to sea because Tillicum won't like being lonesome? Yes, she'll miss Boltar, but maybe she's used to it by now. Yes, maybe she is. I wonder what kind of hunting trip the Prince Valiant is going on. We'll find that out next week. But now... Oh, now, let's go over the page and just see what's there. Very well, over the page we go. Oh, look, Donald Duck, my favorite favorite. Well, if he's a favorite, we'll favor you with Donald Duck <laughs> right now. Say the magic words. Squeeze them, squeeze them, squeeze them, squeeze them, Let's have music to better quack, quack. Donald's looking through his bookshelf for a good book to read. He picks out one... And exclaims, Oh, doggone, I borrowed this from Daisy last summer. He checks another one. Well, 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 this one seems to be hers, too. Hmm, Daisy's again. And another. Well, what do you know? And a moment later, Donald comes out of his house carrying an armful of books. My, my, my. I didn't realize I'd borrowed so many books from Daisy. <laughs> Last picture, top row, Daisy sees Donald coming up the walk with an armful of book, and she says, Well, here comes Mr. Book Borrower. And she opens the door, and first picture, bottom row, they, uh, Donald says, Ah, oh, Daisy, I ran across a few of your books at my house. Well, how nice. Come in. Donald walks right over to her bookshelf and drops the books he's brought on a chair. Then looks at her bookshelf, saying, Oh, mm, I see you have some new ones here. Ah, the bestseller. Daisy sniffs and replies, Yes, I buy a book once in a while. Suddenly he pulls out a book. Oh, boy. There's a no mystery. You mind if I borrow a few of these? No, not at all. Help yourself. And by the time you go... Donald's at home with another armful of Daisy's books. He plops himself in a chair, opens one of the books and says... Aha. I noticed pasted on the inside. What does it say? Daisy's rental library rate 10 cents a day. Donald's eyes pop together, and he groans, 10 cents. Oh, no. <laughs> that was a good joke on Donald. <laughs> yes, Daisy thinks Donald's a cheapskate. Yes, Daisy thinks Donald's a cheapskate. That's because he only borrows a book. He never buys them. Yes, that's because he only borrows a book. He never buys them. <laughs> you have this all figured out. Oh, it's easy to figure out because it's right in front of your eyes. Yes, that's right. <laughs> I just love Donald. He's so cute. Mm-hmm, me too. Yeah, you're cute, but, but not as cute as Donald. Well, I didn't mean I was cute. I mean I love Donald. Oh, excuse me. Yes, I excuse you because you are cute. Thank you. You're welcome. Now, how would you like to see what Donald, or rather Dagwood, is doing? Oh, I love to see 
what Dagwood is doing. Very well, then. Let's see what Dagwood's doing. And here he is on the first page of the second section. And here we go with Dagwood and Blondie. I'm a food, I'm a fun, zim, zam, zombie. Conjure me music for Dagwood and Blondie. <laughs> Dagwood and Herb Woodley, his neighbor, are on their way home from work. And Dagwood is saying, you know, if we'd help each other with the work around our houses, it'd make it, uh, it'd make it a lot easier. And Herb replies, yeah, that's a good idea. <laughs> Short time later, Dagwood explained the idea to Blondie. Knowing Dagwood from experience, she has a questioning look in her eye. Dagwood finishes by saying, You see, we figure, working together, we can get a lot more done. Teamwork. <laughs> Half hour later, Blondie finds Herb and Dagwood, first picture, second row, in the kitchen, tackling a big lunch. She exclaims, Haven't you started yet? Dagwood replies cheerfully, Oh, first we gotta eat. You know, you can't work on an empty stomach, dear. <laughs> Finally, the boys are ready to begin work. Dagwood's on a ladder, ready to plaster the ceiling. Herb's standing beside him, holding the plaster. Dagwood says, Hey, let's sing something. It makes work seem lighter. Yeah, good idea. What's some song we both know? And they begin to sing. Blondie with a cop. She screeches. Quiet! The neighbors are complaining. Dagwood says, oh, Okay, officer, we'll go quietly. Uh, to work, I mean. <laughs> Half hour later, Blondie comes into the living room and finds the boys playing cards. And she exclaims, Cards? And Dagwood replies cheerfully, Well, sure, sure. All work and no play makes Jack a dull boy, you know. She grabs the broom and goes after them, saying, Get to work. In the other room, Blondie hears hammering and sawing, and she's pleased to know that the boys are working. Suddenly, she hears, Hey, you're not doing your share of the work. What's that? What do you mean I'm not doing my share, you lazy loafer? Uh, don't you call me a lazy you loafer, you... Blondie rushes into the room, last picture, third row. Stop it! Stop it! Do you hear? Stop it! You should be ashamed of yourself. Now, now work in peace. First picture, bottom row. Blondie working in the kitchen hears a noise coming from the other room, and she says, I hear them sawing something. Thank goodness at last they've gone to work. So she peeks into the room to see what they're doing and sees Dagwood and Herb on the sofa sound asleep. Well, of all... There is a... That's Dagwood falling to the floor. And then there's a... That's Herb grabbed by the ear. And then... That's Blondie taking Herb home. Herb calls back. Hey, hey don't forget, Dagwood. You, you, you gotta come over and help me now. And Dagwood answers in bewilderment. Uh, oh, oh, okay, Herb. <laughs> <laughs> Those fellows do the silliest thing. Yeah. <laughs> what a nice thing, though. They're always funny, and I love to laugh at them. So do I. Well, now look at the bottom of the page. Oh, Roy Rogers, read that, please. I will in just a moment, but first, here's that nice man again with something interesting to say. Now, here we go again with Puck the Comic Weekly. And on the first page of the second section, under Dagwood and Blondie, Roy Rogers, King of the Cowboys. Magic words for the music, please. Very well, my lady. A yip by yo. Now here we go with Roy and Trigger. A yip by yo. Roy and his friend, Doleful Hawkins, have been trapped in a shack. The rustlers drive a herd of stolen cattle at the shack, sure that Roy will be killed when the cattle stampede over it. First picture, dude exclaims, Well, that takes care of Rogers and Hawkins, boss. The rustlers turn away. And then, a trapdoor where the shack stood is slowly lifted. Roy and Doleful's heads appear. They are safe. Doleful exclaims, Hey, Roy, the shack's gone. The cellar saved us. Suddenly, Roy exclaims, Hey, close the trapdoor, Doleful. Quick, those spook steers are coming back. 
They pull the hedge back and close the trap door. And none too soon, for the herd has swayed around and is coming straight back, running pell-mell for Meeker, Dude, and Rocky. Rocky shouts, Hey, right for your life! The herd's stampede back from the other end of the canyon! The three outlaws ride for the boathouse, anchored at the river. And they make it just in time. First picture bottom row, the cattle dash to the edge of the water, mill around, and finally stop. The outlaws are safe. And then suddenly, Dude exclaims, Hey, look! Here come Rogers and Hawkins alive. And us with our guns and ammo all wet. Roy on shore holding rifles and the three outlaws shouts, All right, Meeker, pull back to shore. We got you covered. And Doleful shouts, And surrounded too, by gosh. Here comes the sheriff. Sure enough, it's the sheriff, his deputy, and the engineer from the train. The train, the cattle rustlers have stolen. The engineer, seeing what's going on ahead, says, Hey, sheriff. That's Rogers and Hawkins who went after the rustlers, just like I said. And the deputy says, Yeah, neat rustling trick. Stealing a train load of steers and transporting them down river by a flat boat so they leave no trail. A short time later, the rustlers are in the hands of the law. At last picture, the sheriff says, Oh, thanks, Rogers. We lost the train, but we got its load of steers back. And the men who rustled them, too. And doleful adds, and don't forget I help, boss. The engineer says, Oh, Roy, you almost forgot. The telegrapher at South Gap has got a message for you. He says it's important. Oh, hooray, hooray, Roy did it again. He captured the rushers and turned them over to the law. Yes, sir. Now they'll be sorry they met Roy Rogers. Yes, they'll be sorry they met Roy Rogers because he's a hero. And he is. Oh, I wonder what that message is about. Well, I have a hunch at the beginning of a new adventure, but we'll find that out next week. Now let's turn over the page and see who's there. Oh, look, on page three, Flash Gordon. And do you remember? A terrible thing happened last week. Um, he's on the planet Mars. And he was captured by Queen Menta, a very cruel woman. And Flash did a wonderful thing for her. He saved her city from the tornado. And then a flood began to sweep over the city. And Flash, Dale, and his friend Link and Menta had been picked up by a rocket ship and taken to the place where the flood was. And Flash dived out of the ship to set an explosion that he said would stop the flood from destroying the city. And then when he came to the surface, he saw Menta was flying away. He wasn't waiting to save Flash. No, she was only thinking of herself, you selfish, cruel thing. And, and when the explosion went off, I, I'm afraid Flash might have been killed by it. Will you please read and we'll find out? I certainly will. Here we go with Flash Gordon. Rega rega doon doon saskamatash. Let's have music for heroic Flash. <laughs> Flash's plan has worked. The explosion floods the channel. The onrushing water to escape into, and the city is saved. But in the explosion, Flash was thrown into the air and has fallen unconscious back into the onrushing waters, where he is tossed about like a piece of driftwood. <laughs> Make sure she'll have no trouble from Dale and Link. Queen Menta had paralyzed Link with a freeze gun. He lies as if in a deep sleep. Dale is held tightly by the pilot. She's so crushed by what's happened to Flash that Menta decides she's no longer a threat. The Queen tells the pilot to let Dale go and to get back at the controls. He releases her. Suddenly, last picture top row, with strength born of desperation, Dale snatches the paralyzing neutral beam from Menta's hands and then orders the frightened pilot to dive down to the canal, saying that they're going to rescue Flash. The pilot obeys. They hang over the water, searching for Flash. Anxiously, Dale looks at the flooded plain, but sees no sign of him. Manta tells Dale it's useless, that she can't fight a whole planet single-handed. <laughs> Last picture, deep in the icy waters, Flash's battered and unconscious form drifts helplessly. His air helmet saves him from drowning, but it offers no protection from another imminent peril, the talons of a hungry whipped shark that's circling warily around its prey. Oh, isn't that terrible? Just when Dale could have saved him, Flash couldn't be seen. Yes, isn't that awful? And worse than that, look at that big shark. Will he eat him up? Well, that's something we'll find out next week. But now I think it's time for Dick's adventure. Oh, yes, and I'm anxious to read that. All right, let's turn over to the very last page, the last page of all. You're right, here it is. You remember last week, 
that this is on expedition with Lewis and Clark, and, and they're out in the wilderness in the freezing winter. Yes, and they've stopped to make camp with some Indians who have become unfriendly. And they were just going to attack Dick and his friends when all of a sudden an Indian made put bracelets on Dick and Lewis and Clark's wrists secretly, and then he told the Indian chief that they were friends of hers. And when the chief saw the bracelets, he ordered peace and then turned and left the white men alone. I wonder who this Indian maiden is. Well, let's read and see if we can find out. Here we go with Dick's adventures. Say the magic words with me. riggedy pack a zack a zick Let's have music for adventurous Dick. The Indian maid has stayed with Dick and his friends. Dick asks her, first picture, Why did you save our lives? Who are you? She tells them, I am Sakagawa. They call me the bird woman. Someday, perhaps, you will return a favor to me. All that winter at Fort Mandan, near what is now Bismarck, North Dakota, Dick and Captain Lewis set to work preparing and mapping the next and hardest part of the journey. Quietly, the bird woman makes herself helpful. Then spring in the year 1805. Once more, the mighty Missouri is clear of ice. The 2,000-mile drive to the Pacific is ready to start on the morrow, and the bird woman watches without speaking. First picture next row, the men busy themselves packing their supplies and loading them on the boat. That night, Captain Lewis and Captain Clark hold a final conference. Lewis states, we're entirely in God's hands, for we have no human guide to show us the way up the Missouri. The maid says, last picture, second row, the time has now come for your favor to me, O oh white brothers. My home is in the mountains where the great muddy river is born. Take me and my husband for your guide. First picture, bottom row, Dick startled at Captain Lewis's sharp reply, no, we have no place for a woman. But Sakagawa simply smiled. Last picture at dawn, she's at the riverside with her husband and another passenger. A little papoose strapped to her back. Dick looks at the tiny face in amazement, wondering how can they ever dare to take care of a little baby like this on such a wild trip. Oh, a little baby papoose. I just love babies, especially when they're papooses. Do you? Yes, don't you? Well, I never had much experience with papooses. Well, neither have I. I have not seen them except in the movies, but I love them anyway. Well, it looks like you're going to see the little papoose for quite a while, if they're going to go with Lewis and Clark. We'll find that out next week. Yes, you bet we will. Now, look underneath Dick's adventures. That's Rusty Riley. Oh, and I'm anxious to read that because those two Englishmen who'd been visiting Mr. Miles stole those gold cups worth loads and loads of money, and they have escaped. Yes, but Rusty and Pete, the two boys, saw what happened, and they had trailed the burglars in Pete's car. And they, they went in Pete's car, even though Mr. Miles told him not to drive because he was too young and he didn't have a license. Mm -hmm. And I'm wondering if anything has happened to Rusty and Pete. Well, let's read right now and find out whether those crooks got away with his robbery. Here we go with Rusty Riley. Gallop and run till the road is dusty. Give us music for his horse and Rusty. <laughs> Mr. Miles sees the empty safe in his study and quietly goes to the phone. Hello, oh, Tex. Hello, Tex. Oh, I'm, I'm glad you haven't gone to bed yet. Uh, come to my study and quick. A moment later, Tex joins Mr. Miles. Hey, what's up, boss? I just got back from town just as you called. This room's been ransacked. Look at the wall safe. Great guns pried right off on its hinges. Any valuables in it? Well, I should say so. All the charity horse show trophies which were entrusted to my care. Last picture, top row, Tex says. Hey, now, wait a minute, wait a minute, Mr. Miles. You better not touch anything. This is a matter for the cops, and there may be fingerprints. Oh, yes, you're right, of course, Tex. Uh, I'll call them immediately. A little later, first picture, bottom row, the police are talking with Mr. Miles. A plain clothesman says... Well, Mr. Miles, well, we've examined the premises. Pretty evident that the burglar entered by the window. The safe, if you want to call it that, 
Let's pry it open with a wrecking bar. An officer in uniform says, uh, Yeah, we found the bar and a cold chisel in the ground outside the window. Some clear fingerprints on them. And we also found some footprints. The detective says, Now, Mr. Miles, uh, we must check on who was here on the farm. I'd like to see them all. Mr. Miles tells Tex, Oh, uh, wake up Rusty and young Peters, will you, Tex? And anybody else who's here? Tex goes after Rusty and Pete. The detective says, Now, just one more question, sir. I understand you had a house guest, the Sir Percival Inglebrook. Oh, yes, yes, Inspector, but you can forget him. Uh, Sir Percival was with me at the country club all evening, and his man Nobbs was there also. A moment later, Tex comes back, last picture, and he says, Oh, boss, here's Jimmy the stable boy. He was asleep, but uh, Rusty and Peter gone. And I hate to say it, Mr. Miles, but that car of Pete's is gone, too. What? Rusty and young Peter's gone? The detective exclaims. Well, now we seem to have a starting place. Oh, no. They're not going to think that Rusty and Pete could ever do a thing like that. Well, I'm sure that Tex and Mr. Miles won't think that. But you see, the point of it is, those officers don't know Rusty and Pete. But what's worse, the fingerprints they'll find on the chisel on the window, of course, will be Rusty and Pete. Well, that mean Mr. Percival fixed it that way. He told Rusty to bring the chisel in the bar and leave it under the window. Yes, and that's what they, those people might think, that the window was opened by them and, and it because Rusty fingerprints are in the bar. And with Pete's car gone, when he shouldn't have taken it, it looks bad. Oh, I hope they won't think that they stole the trophy. My, I hope not. Now, don't be unhappy. I'm sure something will work out to prove they're innocent. We'll find that out next week. Oh, I hope so. Now, that's all the time I have. But before I go, here's that nice fellow with some more interesting information. Well, honey, and all you boys and girls, I've got to go now. All right, Mr. Tonic Weekly Man, but I'll be waiting for you next Okay, that's a date, and a date with all you boys and girls. Be sure to meet me with our little friend, Miss Honey, next week when I read Puck the Comic Weekly. For I'm the Comic Weekly Man, the jolly Comic Weekly Man. I'll be back to read the funnies to you happy boys and honeys. Don't forget, boys and girls, see you all next week. Your friend, the Comic Weekly Man, the jolly Comic Weekly Man. (laughs) 